history. Texas Woman's University professor Catherine Landeck teaches a class about the ways American women contributed to the war effort during World War II. She details the expectations for women on the home front to write letters to soldiers, plant victory gardens, and work in factories. She also compares what options were available for women to serve with each military branch. Her class is about an hour and 20 minutes. Well, it's good to see everybody today. I appreciate you coming to uh, our space here. Uh, today we're going to talk about American women and World War II. And this is obviously a huge topic. We could spend an entire semester just on this topic alone. Uh, so we're going to try to break it down into three different spaces, and we're going to look at a lot of images to kind of fit in with the other things we've talked about. Uh, so we're going to talk about American women in three ways. We're going to talk about women at home. Okay. Uh, women at work. Uh, and women at war. So we're just going to kind of organize um, our ideas this way. And again, we're going to look at uh, a lot of the propaganda. We've been talking about propaganda throughout the semester and watching videos and things like that. Uh, we'll get a chance to talk about everybody found that video okay? The, the, yep. right, that's that's a, a good one on uh, women at work during World War II. You can find it on the National Archives website, right? Um, but we're, we'll talk about that in this portion. But we'll talk about these different parts of... of uh, Women during world, American women during World War II, and again, we're just hitting the survey of this. There's so much that we could talk about throughout the entire semester, um, and we do all of U.S. and World War II, except we can't do all of it. So um, we do our bits and pieces. We've already talked about some of these things, so some of it will be familiar, uh, especially when we get to the women at work part. But but then we'll we'll go from there. Be sure to stop me if you have any questions, and we'll we'll do our thing. Um, okay, so w women at home, right? So w when we think about this, one of the biggest things I want you to do today is think about this reality for the home front, right, which is mainly what we're talking about today, and the reality of what life meant for women in the war. Uh, and one of the first things that we often think about is all the men going away to war, right? The men are, are going off. That means who's left behind? The women, right? The women, right? Uh, and so, you know, a, a lot of the women are married. We've talked about there are all sorts of, you know, quickie weddings going on. But people who've been married uh, for a while as well, this idea of how do you get by, right? If you're a, a household with a, a husband and a wife in this time period, you know, it's a partnership. And each has their role, and they're much more defined roles in World War II than they are, say, today. Uh, so this idea of how are you going to do both your job as the wife and often the mother and the job of the husband? How do you do this? Uh, so this is a very popular book. This came out in 1942. So your husband's gone to war, right? And this idea of what, what do you do? How do you get through it? And you can see from the cover here, um, you know, tackling uh, male chores, right? You know, because chores were defined by male and female, right? Who's going to do which job? And any single woman, any widow, any, uh, you know, woman like that does everything, right? You guys, if you live on your own, you do your own thing. You put your own light bulbs in. You fix your own, make your own repairs. Uh, but this, is a, this book gives some guidance, right? This guidebook. Uh, to help women know how to do those little maintenance jobs that, that they needed to. This is my favorite part, the wolves and the friends' clothing, right? right? This idea of, of we've got wolves, right? That was the phrase of the day about, you know, you know what that means, right? What a wolf, right? Uh, you know, they, they pretend to be helpful. Oh, I'll come change your light bulb for you. I'll come, right? Let me help, let me help. Uh, but really they're, you know, you know not quite as nice as they seem. How do you distinguish between the wolf and the real friend, right? Um, and then this part up in the upper right corner is, is something that's really important. Um, women had a lot of responsibility, not just to do their work and things like this, uh, but this is the lost art of letter, letter writing, right? And this idea that women were responsible for keeping up the morale of men, 
Right? This is going to be a theme that we're going to have through this entire section especially. Uh, the idea that women are responsible for making men remember what they're fighting for, making men feel confident, making men feel that, that it's okay for them to be away, but they're missed and they need to come home. Right? And so this lost art of letter writing, uh, Ethel Gorman writes this whole chapter about how to write your letters to your men. And there's, there's articles in women's magazines, there's articles in mainstream newspapers, all these editorials about how women should write their letters. Right? So what do you think you want to put in a letter? If you're writing to Johnny, who's away in Europe, uh, fighting against the Germans, what do you want to put in your letter as you're writing, writing a w from home? What would you put in there? about how things are going here, just focus on getting the job done. Right, right. Don't worry about how things are, focus on getting the job done, you know, go, go do your thing, we're good here, right? Now, you've got to realize that they want you to write multiple letters a week. If you can write daily, that's best, right? Because imagine your soldier is going and going to get mail every, every day, and if there's nothing there, how depressing that is, right? Oh, I've got to go fight my war, and nobody at home cares about me, right? Uh, that's the guilt, right? So the pressure is to write every day, three days a week, four or five days a week at the minimum, right? So you write that once, and then, and then what do you write, right? And then what, what else do you do? We miss you. We miss you. Please come home, right? But you can't do too much of that, right? Or it'll make him too sad, right? Very cheerful story, but like focus on the war. Right, right. A fun story, right? So a piece of advice that, that Gorman puts in her book is make yourself interesting so your letters are interesting, right? Do interesting things so your letters are interesting. But don't be too interesting because he'll think you're having fun while he's at war. Right? You've got to find that balance between being interesting and not being interesting. Yeah? So what if they don't have a sweetheart at home? Like, are there women getting together to write letters to strangers, that men, to help yeah. out? Yeah, exactly. There's this whole series, this whole campaign. It can be through the Red Cross or different organizations where soldiers would give their names and women would write letters to strangers. Right? You have romances that grow out of that. Right? And this idea of writing letters, talking about what's going on at home. Now, what if, what if your roof gets a leak? Should you write Johnny about that? No. I don't know, right? All right? It's, it's this, this balance between, you know, maybe you wait until the leak is fixed, right? And then you tell Johnny, hey, the roof had a leak, but, but we got it fixed, right? But you don't want to seem too efficient, right? Because if the roof leaks and the plumbing breaks and all these things and you just take care of it, why does Johnny need to come home, right? So it's a lot of pressure on these women to write these letters in these very specific ways, high volume, positive, right? You can say you miss him, but you can't be too blue, right? Um, you, you've got to find this, this balance of... of being responsible and him not needing to worry, but still needing him to come home because it's just you're just not good at it, right? All right, you can get by, but hurry home, right? So it's this it's this balance and this pressure on women that that gets put again. You've got whole books about it, but you've got in different forms of media about women's responsibilities to, to write these letters. And, and the men, you know, I read a lot of these letters that are coming back, right? We don't have as many letters of the women going overseas, right? These, these letters that the women wrote, we don't see as many because the men didn't keep them, right? Uh, where the women kept the letters that the men wrote from, from overseas. Uh, so we have more of those, and so we can figure out what the women were talking about by how the men respond to those letters. So that's one of the ways that we can determine what went into those letters. Um, and, and you see a lot of um, anxiety from the men, uh, especially about the wolves, right? There's a lot of, of ideas about the men who don't serve, right, who aren't able to serve or have these different positions um, d domestically um, and that they're going to try to steal the women, 
right? And that's actually a campaign that the Germans and the Japanese both use in leaflet campaigns is, is you know, the men back home are stealing your girl. Don't you wish that the war was over and, and you could go home, right? Come on in, come on in, right? Um, so, so this idea of the letter writing and things like this, and the fact that this is, this is an incredibly popular book in 1942 um, is, says a lot, I think, that, that women are, are working on this um, and, and going forward, right? Um, so other responsibilities that the women had, right? We've talked a little bit about the rationing. We're going to talk about it more in another week. Um, but this idea of we've got all this rationing, because who is the United States responsible for feeding during the war? Pretty much everybody. Pretty much everybody. Let's narrow that in, down a little. That's good. Right? So who are we responsible for feeding? Right. Our, our allies, right? Right? Our, uh, the allies, right? We're going to give some food to the Russians, the British, and, and all that entails, right? Who else do we need to feed? Our soldiers. Our feed people, our soldiers, right? The, the men and women who've gone abroad, right? We're responsible for feeding them, right? The British aren't going to pull out fish and chips for our soldiers that are out, right? We've got a supply, right? And then who's the third group that we're responsible for feeding? The people we, like, are rescuing. And, like, the people we're rescuing, yes, yes. The home front, right? The people back home need to eat as well. So we've got, we've got rationing so we can get all that manufacturing that we've talked about already. Um, but, but then that reality of food and who's going to eat and who we're responsible for feeding. Um, so there's a lot of um, emphasis on women growing those victory gardens, right? And I've got a slide of that, right? Grow those victory gardens, grow vitamins in your kitchen door. There's a huge growth in um, the study of nutrition in this time period because you want to get as much nutrition in as little food as possible, right? Um, and then this idea of what are women going to do? Well, you, you've got to can that, right? It's one thing to grow a victory garden, but if it's done by the end of the summer, that's no good. Uh, so this idea of canning and, you know, I am, am, am I proud? I'm fighting famine by canning at home, right? right? Look, this is hard, but I'm doing it, right? Uh, and then I love this one with the, you know, the little girl. We'll have lots to eat this winter, won't we, mother? Right? Uh, and very cute. Now, as we go through these, um, we're going to see a lot of these posters and different images. And I want you to be sure to note things like the race of these women that are being portrayed, right? The, the appearance of them, right? These are pretty perfect little, right? That little girl is so cute, you could just pinch her little cheek, couldn't you, right? And this idea of, of who's being re represented, which audience are these government posters, government-sponsored posters trying to reach, okay? Right? Um, okay. Now, another thing that's used uh, is, so women get used in a number of different ways, right? We've got this pressure to try to w get women to take action, but we've also got the effort to use women as propaganda pieces to achieve other goals, right? Um, what do you see in this, in this image? What do you think of this? Sacrifice. Right, sacrifice. Is she, is she a perky, clean-cut gal? No. What is, well, she might have used to been, right? What is she now? She's scared. Does she look very happy? No. No, no right? Right? The baby's laughing, right? Um, but the little girl is clinging to her, not quite knowing what's going on, right? But the woman looks kind of sad and scared. As I gave a man. Remember when we talked about the, the Soviets, right, and how the Americans are like, you got to do more, and they're like, we gave blood, you give money, right? She's saying, I gave a man, right? My children don't have a father. I'm alone and scared, right? Can you at least give 10% of your pay to buy a war bond, right? That is the very least you can do. Look at the sacrifice my family has made. This is the very least you can do. Right? So, so, you know, women being used to, for guilt, right? <laughs> to make you feel, you know, this pressure uh, to, to buy war bonds. Now, review why do we need war bonds? What are the war bonds for? Do you remember? So that way we can pay for all our equipment and all the supplies that are going out. 
Mm -hmm. Right? We, we need it, right? Because we talked about how expensive the war is. And war bonds are one way that we pay for it, right? It's, it's basically loaning money to the government so that you can, so that the government can afford the war, right? Okay, this is another way women are portrayed uh, in these things, right? So uh, information is, is important, right? And there's all sorts of uh, campaigns out there. Don't talk about what's in Johnny's letters, right? Anybody can be listening, right? And this idea of, you know, wanted for murder. Now, what does she look like, right? If she was in a movie, who would she be? Which character? The femme fatale. Right, the femme fatale, the villain, right? Or the neighbor gossip, right? Because women just can't help themselves, right? Right. That's that's the impression that's given in so many of these um, uh, images. And again, we could have. I've got about 20 of these uh, that we could we could look at. This idea that women just can't help themselves gossiping, right? But her gossip costs lives, right? Maybe his life, right? Right. This idea that that you know she looks perfect, but but. Um, her careless talk, right? Her thoughtlessness costs lives, right? So this idea of women need to control themselves, right? To resist their natural urge to gossip, right? <laughs> right? Women are used for sex, right? This idea of images of women as sexual, right? Um, you know, this is a whole famous series of, of uh, prints that I'm sure you guys have seen before. You can see she's a whack, right? She's in the military, uh, but but not in this moment. She's not right. Uh, but this is this is mainstream, right? This is mainstream. This is a picture that came out of Life magazine, right? So this is a mainstream image of the idea of women as these sexualized beings. Because you've got to think about why we're fighting. We're fighting so we can get home to the girl. We're fighting so we can get home, and and because uh, this is what all girls look like, apparently, right? <laughs> right? This reality, right? But but they can't be, so, so women are supposed to be sexual, right? They're supposed to be pretty. They're supposed to be sexual so the men will know what they're fighting for. But they can't be too sexual, right? Um, give you guys a minute to take a look at these. Right? You like these? What do you think? What do you think? <laughs> right? So what do you see in these images? How are women being portrayed in these images? They're spreading disease. They're spreading disease, right? This one is one of my all-time favorites. She may look clean, but, right? There's a whole series of these images, these posters, that are given to men um, at the different bases and overseas. Uh, you know, whole classes on, on venereal disease. But this idea that, you know, these, these good time girls and pickups, these are a problem, right? So we want to give you posters like this to hang up, but don't touch, Right, because they're probably diseased, right? Um, so this idea of of women as as all these different things, right? Women are mothers. Women are, um, you know, raising the gardens and saving and feeding everyone. And women are sacrificing. Women are writing letters and being good for morale. Women are, you know, these sexual beings. Uh, and women are also diseased. Right? All these things all at the same time, right? This idea of, of I, I, I just think this is, right? I, 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 right? 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 And again, you can, there's a whole series of these um, that are out there, and they're promoted among, among all these men, right? So that's our uh, women at home. Is that, do you guys have questions about that? Or, okay. All right, well, let's, let's switch to our next topic here, this idea of women at work, women at work. And we think of this a lot, right? When we think of women in World War II, um, we often think of uh, these working women, right? right? And this is the point of the class, uh, the section of the course. Uh, you know my favorite thing is to be a myth buster, right? That's, that's what we do. That's what historians do. That's our job. Um, and so this, this section, we're going to bust some myths. I'm sorry, um, but we are. Okay. Um, so when we think of women working in World War II, um, one of the biggest things that is often talked about is the idea that women go to work, 
right? Okay, all the women go to work, right? Now, do you guys remember your U.S. history class, your survey, right? What did you learn about women working? Did women work before World War II? No? Not according to my U.S. survey class, no. Really? What about in the factories at the turn of the century? What about those immigrant women? Yeah. Some, but it wasn't like a, as widespread, and it wasn't mothers or so Okay, was, okay. So, so all those factories um, that, that came out through the Industrial Revolution and all those children, right, that child labor, did women not work in those factories? Right? Lots of young single women, lots of young single women, lots of immigrant women, right? What about women of color? Did they work? You think so? Yeah. A lot of them were teachers. Yeah. Well, women of color didn't get a lot of teaching jobs. At, you know, coming up to here, they do, right? Coming out of the progressive era, we get more, um, more women of color taking middle class jobs, right? But, but women, women have always worked, right? You've always had working class women, right? Working class women, immigrant women, women of color, unmarried women, right? That have always worked, right? So which women are we really talking about when we say women began to work during World War II? Middle class white middle women. Class. Middle class white women, right? We're talking about middle class white women, this expansion into this area that, that people didn't work before, right? And then a second group tied in there is going to be mothers, right? More mothers are going to work in World War II than worked before, right? So it's a shift from working class women, immigrant women, women of color working, right, uh, to that expansion of uh, middle class white women, right? And so that's what we often see portrayed in these posters, right? Look, I mean, look at, these, look at these women, right? First of all, their teeth are perfect. Right, which did not happen in the 1940s. Right, they all look like movie stars. They all have their eyebrows just right, their hair just right. Right, they're beautiful. Right, this is not what most people ever look like, let alone in the 40s. Right, right. Um, but but this idea of of who the target is. Right, who's the target for for the working? Because this is the group that we have in excess that we can target to get to get to get to work. Right. So that's an important distinction I want to make sure that we understand which women we're talking about when we say the workforce expanded to women. It's, it's a specific group of women that are going to be expanded, right? Um, now, one area that often doesn't get talked about uh, in women working in World War II is women in agriculture, right? This idea of women in agriculture. So it's, it's important to realize that we have over... Uh, six million agricultural laborers and farmers that leave the land during World War II, right? Over six million people who'd been working um, the land leave it during World War II. Uh, and these are often going to be men who are going to uh, work in the, in the factories because they're better paid. Uh, these are going to be men who are being drafted or enlisting, right? The shortage of laborers, agricultural laborers, gets so bad during the war that by mi the middle and late 1942, it becomes a draft-deferred position. What's draft-deferred position? Do you remember? You don't have to go over to the war. Your job is war critical. Right. Your job is war critical. So you, you cannot be drafted. You cannot be drafted. If you leave that job, you may be eligible for the draft. But if you're in that position, you're draft-deferred. So agricultural laborers, farmers, they become draft-deferred because we need people so badly. That doesn't mean you can't enlist. That doesn't mean you can't go work in a factory, right? Though by late in the war, there are limits on that. You have to get permission to do that, right? Uh, so we're at the same moment that we're expanding the uh, agricultural needs because we're feeding people at home, we're feeding people, Americans abroad, and then we're feeding all of our allies, right? Helping feed our allies. At the same time we're doing that, the laborers are shrinking. Uh, so there's a huge push to get American women involved in this, right? And we'd seen this before. We'd seen this um, in World War I. There was a volunteer organization called the Women's Land Army of America that, that uh, was around. Uh, we expand that in World War II. There was a Women's Land Army in Great Britain, and we model a lot of, a lot of what goes on in the United States after that. But there's this huge push uh, to get American women 
uh, as part of this. Um, there were other organizations of the Bracero program. Have you guys read about that? So what was the Bracero program? It was an agreement between the U.S. and Mexico to allow workers to come and work in the fields. Right, exactly. This agreement between the United States and Mexico to allow uh, laborers to come to the United States and work. Um, and this program goes from 1942 to 1951. Right? So this is a huge program we'll talk about in another class. Uh, but they try that. Uh, to ex the government tries that to expand the number of, of laborers. Uh, they also go to convicts, right, uh, prison labor, uh, which had been used some in the past but gets expanded. Uh, they also use um, POWs, right? We had POWs here in Texas, and we had some in Oklahoma and, and in different regions of the country uh, where, you know, you'd have German and Italian POWs that would come to the United States and put them in the farms. Right? Let them be laborers. Um, uh, so, so you've got all these different groups. And then, and then this huge push, let's get more women. Right? Let's get more women to do this. Right? Uh, some basic numbers for you. Uh, we end up with something like 3.5 million women working in the, in the agricultural field. 3.5 right? million women. Right? Which is a much bigger number than you think of. Right? You think of World War II... Usually we just think of Rosie the Riveter, right, or the women pilots because you're here at TW and have me as a professor, right? Uh, but, but, you know, three and a half million women are, are recruited. There's, there's some bias against them in the beginning. You can read a lot of uh, documents about this idea of women aren't going to be able to do the job. Uh, you know, we can't trust them. This idea of urban women especially, right? Nobody wants a city girl to come work on their farm. Right? They're going to break their heel and not be able to do it. Right? But, but very quickly, the women are, prove themselves, right? that they're, they're able to do the work that needs to be done uh, and, and make a real difference. Uh, to some basic numbers, uh, 1940, women made up 8% of all farm workers. By 1945, it was 23%. Right? So women went from 8% in agriculture to 23% in agriculture just that quickly, right? And again, this is all going to shrink back down after the war just because we, don't, we aren't growing as much after the war. Um, but but this is, that's a significant amount, right? Three and a half million women working on farms. You know, there's a, a new costume idea for you for Halloween, right, is, is to you know, dress, up, dress up like a... a a farm worker, women's land army, right? Uh, everybody does Rosie, right? 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 Um, now, now, this idea of, of women in labor, um, right? So, this is you can't talk about women at work without talking about this, right? Who do you guys see here? Rosie, Rosie the Riveter, right? So, this is the part, uh, another part of the class that I'm going to bust some myths, yeah. I was going to say, when I was working the head in the Army, mm -hmm. media, it, it started off with, I guess it was supposed to be like somebody playing Hitler or something, mm -hmm. talking about how American women and were spent more on personal stuff than mm -hmm. the U.S. military period did for, and they, for their own supplies, right. while German women were put to work as... Baby producers, basically. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But I was kind of curious as to how, at the time, the U.S. thought about its women becoming part of the major workforce, and I don't think that was really discussed in the video. How was how were American women treated by? American men who are still working in the factories at that time. Right. So this is a really good question. How are the women that are, are working um, in the factories uh, treated by the men? How do they interpret them or feel about them coming into the war? And, and I've got some numbers for you just to give you some big ideas. Um, the female labor for force grows by 6.5 million uh, during, during this period, right, during World War II. Um, a shift from 25% of American women working in 1940 to 37% of all American women working in 1944, right? So this is going to be a huge shift. Now, to answer your idea of how were they, how were they seen? Because women, women did work, but 
women are dominating a lot of these factories especially. And the reality is a lot of the men were put in charge, right? They were put in supervisory roles. If they'd been working in the factory and had experience, then they're going to be put into these roles. And, and you're going to have all sorts of different interpretations of them, right? Some are going to be happy to have them as laborers. Some of them are going to not believe they can do the job. Some are going to be, you know, sexist or, or harassers or whatever. It just, it just depended on the time and the place, um, how, how they were doing it. The reality is we couldn't have done the work that we did during the war without them. Right, just by sheer by sheer numbers. Right now, as you brought up the film, uh, that hidden army, I want to give you guys a chance to talk about that. Uh, it, this is a propaganda film that was done in 1944, before the war is over, and how does it begin? Is Hitler in a Hannibal Lecter-like cell, writing about how oh I shouldn't have underestimated those American women? Right, right. It's this it's this strange setup, right? of a prison guard coming down and Hitler in a cell writing a memoir, right? Like he wrote Mein Kampf in prison, now he's going to write, you know, How I Lost the War, right? And again, this is before the war is over, so this is, a, this is how we're going to do it, right? How we're going to put Hitler in this position. And the name of one of his chapters is The Hidden Army, right? And it's, and it's women, right? It's women. So what pieces do you see this? And we've talked about, we watched the documentary Memphis Bell from the war and as a propaganda piece. We've watched um, some of Frank Capra's Why We Fight films as well, right? So try to put this hidden, hidden army film into that context of propaganda. And what pieces did you see that looked familiar or that were a little different or that were focused on women a little bit more? Yeah. It was interesting that they did like the interviews with women about like why are you here and I was like some of that seems very fake. To yes. Like. Yes. Right. So they interview different women what and say why are you here in the factory why are you doing what are you, what you're doing and they're definitely set up right yeah. this isn't some random let's walk up on the street to a random worker and say this yeah. Now you see more of like that guilt um, of not working, like the, the girl that wakes up in the morning and just goes back to sleep, and like because of that, people are dying, and mm -hmm. like more of that is similar in the Memphis Bell when they show like the dead people. Yeah. And you see more of that, you get more of that attitude with this film, so. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Definitely, yeah. There was also an entire sequence of women getting telegrams saying, oh, by the way, your son, husband, brother is dead. Uh, mm -hmm. The woman in particular just flinging herself on the bed crying when her, when her son's going, Mommy, what's wrong? Mm -hmm. Just, you guys are not being subtle at all. I, right. I can respect you for that, but wow. Right, yeah, there's no subtlety to this film. It's definitely a propaganda piece. Everybody watching it knows it's a propaganda piece, right? And we're so cynical today, right? You got to wonder, were they as cynical then as we are? You know, did they watch this drama? Um, but yeah, the obvious slacker who shuts her alarm off and goes back to sleep, and then Johnny dies because she went to sleep instead of working in the factory, right? Very dramatic, very on point. The telegram saying, you know, you've lost your person. The reality is people are dying, right? People are going and miss missing in action. People are receiving those telegrams. And we've talked about this um, in the past when we talked about that manufacturing chapter of David Kennedy's book, this idea that American stuff, right? Our tanks, our planes, all those things helped win the war, right? So, so there really is a direct correlation between people not going to the factory and people not having the supplies they need, right? But, but very, very dramatic, very, very done, right? Were there other points of that film that you guys noticed or um, wanted to make sure we had talked about? It's, it's very short. It's like seven minutes. Um, but it's it's kind of fun, right? I think it, you know it's one of those where you don't want to giggle, but but it's like oh my god, it's so over the top. Um, but but it's something that was important, and we talked about a little bit um, when we talked about manufacturing the idea that people were having strikes, and when we talked I think last week about censorship, the idea that earlier in the war uh, the War Department censored photos, right? They wouldn't show. Um, men dead on the beach and things like that because it, it was just too hard, right? It was too hard. But by 1944, they're letting those images out, right? They're showing more of those images. They're showing more of this drama of the families being affected. They're showing more of the violence that was occurring to the soldiers. And why were they doing that? Those people were 
factory to slack. They thought they had won the war already, so why go continue to go to the factories and work? Exactly, exactly. We weren't being bombed, right? We weren't, you know, with some exceptions in the north, Northwest and, and, of course, Pearl Harbor, most Americans weren't being impacted as, as they were in England or, other, or France or other places, right? So this idea of, I don't want to go to work today. What's the consequence? Who cares? Right. There's also another moment in the film where they show uh, bombed out cities. I'm not sure if that's like in Italy or in Britain or anything like that. But it basically says, all right, if you don't go to work and do this thing, we could get bombed here. Mm -hmm. Please take this seriously. Yeah. Yeah. And we've looked at some of those images of, you know, that idea of we want to stop the fighting over there. Right. We want to stop it in Europe. We want to stop it in the Pacific before it comes here. Right. Because we're next. That's the goal. Right, so go to the factory, right? Go to the factory and get the job, get the job done, right? Okay, so this idea of, of women working um, was was important, right? Um, right, um, just to kind of drive home the point of which women are working uh, and how how it changed. Before the war, only thirteen point nine percent of American women who are married are working, right? And that number goes up to almost 24% during the war, right? So it's still a pretty small number, isn't it, right, if you think about it. Now, that's a little warped by the fact that you have so many marriages during World War II, right, those kind of quickie marriages that, that occur. We, we, we've known each other for two weeks, but you're about to go overseas. Let's get married, right? Um, now, it's, it's important to realize, just a side note, that, that the divorce rate between 1945 and 1952 is astronomical. It's the highest divorce rate in American history is those seven years because everybody comes back from war and it's like, ooh, I don't really know you. Maybe this isn't a good idea, right? Um, but, but that idea of married women, married women working, right? So we've got, we've got this image, this we can do it, we can do it image. Um, which is so popular and, of course, so important, right? Um, and uh, the, the idea of Rosie the Riveter um, comes from a song, right? This is a 1942 song. It is incredibly popular, uh, and we'll see. I'm going to try to play it for you. Let's see if I can make this work, All right? Just because it's, it's so fun. Anything with a ukulele is good, right? It's a longer song than that, but we'll we'll stop there. Right? Wasn't that fun? I like it. Right? It's going to be stuck in your head all day, <laughs> and it's going to be my fault, and that's okay. Right? Right? I know it's my fault. I'm sorry. That's my job is to get into your brains. Right? <laughs> right? So this is an incredibly popular song. It gets covered by everybody. Right? It gets covered by everybody. The Four Vagabonds makes it popular in 1942. But then just about everybody who's singing, and remember, music is such an important part of all of this during the war that, that uh, uh, it's just so popular. So, so this idea of Rosie the Riveter, there's also Wendy the Welder, right? There's another, all of that, right? This idea of, of going and working in the factory, right? Um, so, so we've got this image, and this is the myth-busting portion of the class. Um, this idea of Rosie, um, the riveter, I'm sorry, 
but this woman was not called Rosie the Riveter until the 1980s, right? She was a poster um, uh, created by uh, Gerald Miller uh, for Westinghouse Corporation's factories. It hung up in their factories for two weeks in February of 1943, and that was it. This was not a poster that inspired all of America. This was not an image that made people sit up and go to work, right? I'm very sorry. You can still love her, right? You can still dress up like her for Halloween, <laughs> right? Um, but but um, she is, she is um, uh, definitely a worker, right? It definitely fits. It's not dishonest to call her Rosie, all right? Look at, look at the image from the cover, right? Very similar. And we'll have images of real Rosies, right? Um, but, but she wasn't called that during the war, right? Um, this is Rosie the Riveter, right? You guys recognize Norman Rockwell? Right, from his own paintings of himself. That's how I'm like, oh, I know him, right? right? This idea of Norman Rockwell. This is Mary Doyle Keefe. Uh, she was 19 years old. She was his neighbor. He was a pretty broke artist at the time. Um, she, he paid her $5 to come to his studio, and he had a photographer take pictures of her in different poses. Um, he liked to work off of photographs instead of um, live, live subjects. Uh, then they had her come back a week later and put on a blue shirt and penny loafers, right, for, so he could, he could uh, work off of that photo. She got $5 for each session. So she got $10 uh, to, to be Rosie the Riveter. Um, he wrote to her afterwards or, or called her afterwards and apologized for making her look so hefty, right? Rosie's got these big, strong arms and is a big girl, right? She's a big, strong girl. And, and Mary Doyle Keefe is... Uh, you know, a slender 19-year-old. He said, I just want you to know, I, it's okay. I'm sorry about that. And she, she was okay. I mean, obviously, the, the thing went very popular. Uh, but this is, this is Rosie. You can see her lunchbox says Rosie on it, right? So the song had come out and was popular. And then he did this painting and, and dubbed her Rosie the Riveter. And this is just another, you know, I like little trivia for you, right, uh, to see how this was inspired Right, uh, Michelangelo, uh, um, you know, Isaiah has dropped his sandwich, I think. <laughs> <laughs> right, 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 but this idea, right? So how often does, um, does Rockwell do this? I don't know enough Rockwell history, but, but uh, I, I love how, you know, this, this uh, similarity between the two. It's obviously what he did um, and, and uh, very popular. Right? So this is the image that gets taken all over the country. Right? This is the image that gets turned into posters. This is the image that people have hanging up and think about as Rosie the Riveter. Um, not, not our we can do it girl. As much as we love her, and you can still love her, but she's a creation. Right? We talk about that a lot in here, the idea that, that people use the past for different things. Right? And in the 1980s, they used that image to, to inspire women, right, and called her Rosie. Um, but again, we bust myths in here. So uh, this is Rosie, right, this is Rosie, uh, representing all those women. She, the real Rosie, um, n never actually riveted anything. She was a telephone operator. She never riveted anything, um, but, but she posed. And we have this, this terrific, terrific image, right, with her lunchbox and such, right? Um, just one more image, this is her in 2015 um, with a, a copy of it. I just think she's great, right? She just, just was very nice, um, very nice, happy, happy lady, right? Um, right, so we've got that, um, this idea of promotion of, of women working. We've talked about the fact that the federal government had all these different commissions, all these different boards to try to help organize the economy, control the economy, this idea of uh, women doing different jobs. And this is one of my favorite posters. It's not seen quite as often. It's drawn in a different style than some of the others. Uh, but this idea of look at all these different jobs are women, women are doing, right? Um, we often think of Rosie the Riveter, Wendy the Welder, people working in aircraft factories or the naval shipyards building the ships. Uh, but you'll note this one has has a waitress on there, right? And there's a whole series of advertisements saying, B 
being a waitress is a war job, right? Because somebody needs to feed the workers. Somebody needs to feed the people who are doing these other jobs, right? This type of work is just as important. We just need you to work. You don't have to be a mechanic, right? You don't have to weld, but, but work, right? And I wanted to point out, too, in this one, you see the one here in the middle has gray hair. So this is another target, is women in their 40s and 50s to help them get into the workforce doing these different jobs. Um, you, know, you know, you can roll bandages, right? But we really need more people in the factories or more people doing these different jobs, right? And we've talked about the fact that women are uh, working when they're married and when they're mothers, right? Well, who's going to care for the children if you're working a 10-hour shift at Willow Run or down here at Lockheed? Grandmothers. Grandmothers, right? So there's a huge push. Uh, Eleanor Roosevelt, we've talked about her a lot, about how she advocates for different groups. Eleanor Roosevelt, one of the things she advocates for in this period is the idea of um, government-supported uh, child care, right? This idea of child care. If you want women to work, if you want women to be a part of uh, this war effort, then you've got to have somebody watching their children, right? And we know child care is a problem for families today, right? It's not just a women's problem, it's a family problem, but affordable child care is a problem, right? And in the 1940s, it's an even bigger problem because there was even less infrastructure for child care because women, once you had children, you don't work. You take care of the kids, right? And again, working class women, immigrant women, and women of color always did and found, found ways. But Eleanor Roosevelt says, let's, let's have some child care. So there are some child care facilities set, set up across the country, but they're in such small numbers uh, that it's just completely inadequate. So the people that, that are going to watch the children are going to be family, right? Grandmothers or this idea of support um, within the community. Uh, so that gets promoted as a war job, right? If you work as a child caregiver, you are enabling someone else to go and work in the factory. If you've got arthritis in your elbow and can't um, rivet, maybe you can feed a baby a bottle, right, and do your part. So this idea of all these jobs are important, all these jobs help with the war effort uh, and, and make a difference to the whole thing, right? Um, we often think of Rosie the Riveter uh, as, you know, the epitome of, of uh, women working during the war, uh, but the reality is more women typed than anything else, right? And when we get to the women at war, we're not going to highlight that, but I want to kind of sneak it in now. Uh, that's one of the biggest things that, that um, women do in the military as well, right? You've got the civil service women working for different parts of the government as part of civil service, but then women in the military too. Remember, there are no computers, right? And everybody has orders, right? And they're all in triplicate or quadruplicate, right? Everything is typed. Everything is typed. One of the, my favorite resources in my own research is when I find transcripts of phone calls because they, every government official, depending on your level, right, would have a stenographer that would listen in, right, and, and take shorthand, right, the ultimate secret language, right, take shorthand of the phone conversation and then type out the phone conversation. So in the National Archives, we have transcripts of phone calls between generals, between important people making business decisions, right? We've got transcripts of all those phone calls. They're hard to find because they're not labeled that way. Right? So you have to look through a lot of boxes, but, but somebody typed those. And that's going to be women that are typing those. And these are on, you know, this, this one, one of the things about a lot of these posters is they're sponsored by different companies. We've talked about that before, I think, the idea that they want to promote their company by, you know, sponsoring the bonds or, or whatever. And so Royal Typewriter Company sponsors this type of ad, right? You go and serve your country but do it by typing, and wouldn't you rather have a royal typewriter than any other, right? Um, so it's a, it's a quiet plug for their own company, uh, but supporting, supporting the war effort, right? This is another push, right? Uh, this idea of, you know, she's holding his, his letters, 
and, and uh, being all sad and, and uh, lonely, crying, right? Do you see the tears? Isn't that sad, right? But her lipstick is perfect, yes. right? Right, right. Um, but but uh, what, what, is this, what is this essentially saying to this girl or any lonely girl? Don't cry about it. Get to work. Don't cry about it. Get to work, right? Chin up. Chin up, <laughs> right? Don't be a baby. Go do something about it. Right, this idea that it you can make only you can bring him home, right? Only you can end this war by going to work. If you're going to sit home and shut your alarm clock off and and sit around and cry, nothing's going to happen. You you have to go to work. You have to get this job done, right? What else we got here? Again, this other this same similar type of theme, right? The men would rather be doing this work. The men are probably better at it than you are, um, but somebody's got to do it. Right, and, and do the job he left behind. Now, what's with the head wrap? Talk to me about that. You know, we see that in the image of Rosie the Riveter. Um, why? Why? Because when you set their hair with pin curls and stuff, so you, have, yeah. you don't want yeah, to Yeah, you can set up. your hair in pin curls. Are you going to wear your hair in pin curls to the factory, do you think? No. no, and you don't want your hair getting caught in any of the machinery. Oh, yeah. Right. You will get scalped. Right, right. So this is a safety issue, right? This is the idea of you've got to... You've got to keep your hair up, and this is the simplest way. So you can do double duty, right? You can put your hair up in pin curls, wrap it up, then you don't, like, kill yourself wrapping it around a, a drill press or something, uh, and then you can go out and go dancing afterwards, right? <laughs> right? So it's, it's killing those two birds with one stone, right? But again, I, I want to point out the image that we've got here of this woman, right? Does she look like she's sweating, working? No, right? She's perfect. She's perfect. She's perfect. She's beautiful. She's got her makeup on. She's got, I don't know, are those fake lashes or are those her real lashes? I don't know, right? Um, she's, and again, the perfect lipstick, right? So, so this, is, this is the image that's being left of, of these women is, is these, these very perfect images, right? Now, we, we talk about this and we look at all these different images. This is a very serious effort, right? This is a very serious effort. Right? So this is a group of women. They, some of them just have hairnets instead of bandanas. Right? Um, but, but this is important work. These are the noses of bombers. Right? Can you, tell, can you see that? Right? Those are going to go on the nose of bombers. Um, and it's important. Right? There's going to be a man sitting in here. Right? And, and if you don't do it right, he could die. Right? So this is important work. We've got to get those numbers out there. Now, just to review, we've talked about this idea of of the, the manufacturing. Do you remember when we talked about FDR in 1942? He said uh, um, 60,000 new airplanes, right? We had like 9,000 airplanes before we got involved in the war. We're going to build 60,000 new airplanes in 1942 and 125,000 airplanes in 1943. You think about that reality. How the heck are we going to do that, right? How, how is this even possible? that we spooled up so quickly in our, in our factories and in our manufacturing, and that we reached those goals, right? We built 300 airplanes over the course of the war, go from 9,000 to over 300,000 in the course of the war, right? We're supplying the Soviets, we're supplying the British, and we're supplying ourselves. We are completely overwhelming the Ger Germans and Japanese, completely overwhelming them. And it's because we've got women working in these factories. All right, women working in these factories. Right. I want to show you some pictures of the real Rosie the Riveters, right? We've got this one, which, again, anything with lots of airplanes, you know I love, um, right? Um, but this is another image of Rosie the Riveter. So, again, I want to make the point that even though most of the poster images that we see are targeting those middle-class white women and this idea that you can still be attractive and feminine if you're working in the factory, uh, the reality is you've got a lot of women of color who are going to be in these positions uh, and doing these different jobs. Uh, I, I love this. This is one of my favorite ones, um, so much so that I have it twice for you because I like, the, I like this one um, because of the reflection on the plane, right? You can see her ring in the reflection um, and this idea of she's still feminine. Uh, she's got this beautiful ring. Look at her nails. I don't know if she knew she was going to be photographed the next day or if she just kept her nails that pretty because it, it made her feel feminine while she's doing this work, right? 
this idea of, of um, women doing this work while still being feminine. But, but the target in a lot of that advertisement isn't women of color, but you see a lot of, of different women that are taking these jobs. And again, this is why I say we can still call the we can do it woman Rosie, because she looks like a lot of these women, right? This idea of the, the bandanas to hold their hair up, uh, doing these different types of, of jobs. Um, the shoes is always of, of interest to me, the types of shoes, right? They were penny loafers, they were you know, little loafers, no work boots for this group of, you know, for this generation, right? I like this one too. Um, what do you see up there in the corner of that? I guess I've got a, right? What do you see here? Men working together. Right? right? The idea of men doing these different jobs. You can see the one on the right is a sailor. So that's the kind of place that, that we can do it poster would have, would have hung, right? Just on the back wall of the factory kind of thing. Just to remind people while you're there, right? You're not just here doing a job. It, it gets romanticized a lot, doesn't it? This idea of, oh, you're building this plane and you're going to save a man and he's going to fly it and he's going to kill the Germans or he's going to kill the Japanese and we're going to win the war and it's going to be because you riveted that, right? Your rivet saved the, saved the world, right? But it's also boring, right, if, to do the same thing every day. It's dirty, it's loud, it's mundane, right? So it's how to find that balance between making people realize you have to keep coming to work. It's important for you to keep coming to work and, and getting through the, the boringness of doing the same thing every day, right? How to, how to find that balance, how to find that balance, right? Uh, just another one. These are ship fitters. Um, you know, we, in my classes, I always show all the airplane pictures, but it's important to realize we built uh, tens of thousands of ships during World War II. Uh, and these are women uh, working in one of the shipyards. And again, I, I like this picture because it's, uh, it's diverse, right? You've got an Asian woman, uh, probably Asian-American woman. You've got an African-American woman, and white women all working together. You've got the guy in the back smiling. I don't, nice guy, right? I'm huh? I'm here, too. I'm here, too, <laughs> right, right. Um, but, but uh, you know, this, much of the workers are integrated, right? This isn't where the, while the military was still integrated, uh, excuse me, while the military was still segregated at this time, uh, the workers were integrated, right? Um, so I think that's important, right? <coughs> so you've got all different types of women uh, working. You know, look at, look at that sweater and shirt, right? It's like, you're gonna get dirty. Right, you're gonna get dirty. They all have ID badges, right, with photo IDs, right, with photo IDs, because these are secure facilities, right? It depends where you are and what you're doing, how secure it's gonna be, uh, but these are secure facilities, so you're gonna need to have, gonna have these, these photo IDs, right? This idea of, of, uh, of photo IDs, um, right? I like this one. You know, there's a, a limited series of color photographs during the war, right? Color film was fairly new and was fairly expensive. Uh, so there's this whole series of color photographs, which I think it's like, wait a minute, they're real, right? It adds a whole other level of things. But, you know, you think of all the different jobs. Um, this woman is literally painting on, on the plane, right? She's painting the, the star on the plane. This is fabric. Right, this is a fabric plane, um, probably a trainer. Um, but but uh, so artists had jobs, right? All sorts of different jobs, not just you know the factory riveting. Right? Um, why did it matter uh, that women went to work? Right? This is the the Willow Run factory up in Detroit, uh, near Detroit. Uh, it's in um, Belleville, uh, Michigan, actually. Um, this, of course, was Ford's factory uh, that got transitioned into this uh, bomber factory. Uh, and this is huge. This is one of my favorite photographs. Um, can you see the person here sticking their head out? Yeah. Right, just to give you a scale of, of the planes that we're talking about. These are B-24 Liberators. This is the E model, obviously. Um, this one factory at Willow Run builds over 9,000 of the 18,000 B-24s that are built during World War II, right? I mean, think about the scale of that. Uh, they were building uh, one every, every 
63 minutes by 1944. One of those was coming off the assembly line every 63 minutes. Think about how complicated that machine is, right? This is a big four-engine plane um, and, and uh, incredibly, incredibly important, right? And, and then they'd, they'd go off to war, right? And again, we've talked about uh, previously in this class, we've talked about the scale of the stuff, right? The planes, the ships, the tanks, the guns, the, sh the trucks, the jeeps, all of these things, and, and how we just overwhelmed the enemy, uh, and this is this is one example of it. So when you think about you know women at work during the war and whether they really needed to do it, uh, this is the result, right? And it's it's not because they're women, right? It's because they're workers, right? And they were able to do the jobs that needed to be done, um, and and make a real difference, make a real difference in the war, right? Okay. Um, just some other sh quick statistics for you. Uh, remember, we're, we're reaching our goals of feeding everyone, right? Both ourselves here at home, our soldiers abroad, uh, and our allies uh, overseas, right? We build over 300,000 planes over the course of the war, right? 300,000 planes. Now, that's going to be everything from trainers to the bombers and the P-51s and all, all of them. Uh, but 300,000 planes uh, over the course of the war. We're also supplying 60% of our allies' munitions, 40% of the whole world's arms, that's enemies and ours, right? We're giving 10% of the Soviet Union's total military needs. That means we gave the Soviet Union 350,000 trucks, right? 350,000 trucks. We gave them 956,000 miles of telephone cable, right? All those little things that you think, of, you know, maybe don't think of that, that we had to give them, right? Um, and all doing this while our population is healthy and better fed than we'd been in a generation, right? Because we had that study of nutrition. Um, we had all the farming going on, right? So all those things had to come together. Right? It really did make a difference. Again, we look at all these images and this idea of, of it being kind of fun and, and you know, some of it sexist and some of it kind of racist, and, uh, but, but it all comes together, right? this idea of different people working. Right? Um, there's a lot of discussion about the jobs that women had before and after the war um, and this idea of women working and what happens to women after. And I want to make one final point on this idea of women at work, right? Everyone during World War II is able to change their opportunities, right? The, the work that they do. So you've got women um, that are working at this level, right? They're working at this level during World War, before the war. Um, and men are working here, right? Well, as, as the men are able to move up into different positions, the women are able to move up into the positions the men were, right? right? And so after the war, as the men come back down in the types of positions and the pay of the positions that they have, the women are going to come back down too, right? They're always going to stay a notch below when it comes to pay, when it comes to opportunity, that's going to be the same for women of color, especially, right? They're going to be below uh, white women on the pay scale, but they're going to be higher than they were before, right? Uh, women as domestic laborers drops by um, over 15% during World War II, right? The idea of how many women were working as domestic laborers. And that's going to be a lot of women of color that are going to be doing those jobs, a lot of immigrant that are women that are going to be doing those jobs that during the war are able to take better paying jobs. And then after the war, they're going to get bumped back down to which types of jobs they can have. OK? So questions about women at work? Right, this idea of women working? OK. Well, we'll switch to our third, our third topic here. Uh, and our third focus, uh, our final and third focus today, is going to be women at war. Right, this idea of women at war. Okay. One of the biggest things I want you to walk away with today 
is the idea that uh, we have between 350 and 400,000 women are going to serve in the armed, American Armed Forces during World War II. It depends who you count and who you don't, that we've got that discrepancy. Uh, but again, between 350 and 400,000 people, uh, women that are serving in the American Armed Forces. And the thing I want you to remember about them is that they were all volunteers. Right? We talk about the millions of men that served in the Armed Forces during World War II. The vast majority of those were drafted. Many of them volunteered. But every woman veteran from, from the beginning of time in the United States to today, every woman veteran you meet is a volunteer. Right? And I think that's a really important thing to remember about women in the military and women who are veterans. Right? So in World War II, you've got that 350 to 400,000 women that are serving in World War II. This is my little public service announcement, if you will. Um, uh, have you guys been to Arlington National Cemetery? Have you seen this? Have any of you been there? Um, this is the uh, Women's Memorial, Women in Military Service for America. Uh, it's right at the doorstep. When you, when you pull up to the Arlington National Cemetery, you can find it there. Um, and it says Women's Memorial, but it's really a museum and an archive. They gather oral histories and documents of women uh, in World War II. And it's really just a terrific nonprofit organization. It was started by Congress. Unfortunately, not funded, uh, so of course, uh, so it gets a lot of, of, of donations and things like that. But it's a really terrific um, organization. It's the only place in the country that's just for women, right? Just for women veterans, recognizing them. So um, I think that's that's important and kind of a public service announcement for you there, right? Uh, so one of the first groups that we think of when we think of women serving um, in the military is of course nurses, right? This is a fairly idealized promotion, right? <laughs> right? Uh, very pure, very clean. Who's putting the hat on her? Uncle Sam. Uncle Sam, right? We don't even need to know. And again, this is a very attractive young woman, very white, uh, uh, perfect makeup, all of this, right? Gonna be very, very intelligent. But Uncle Sam saying, we need you, right? Become a nurse. Your country, your country needs you, right? Um, you know, there were women doctors as well. There was a very small group of women doctors as well. Uh, but all in all, we, we get about 74,000 women who serve in the Army and Navy Nurse Corps during World War II. 74,000, right? Um, so this is this is a lot. We had only 7,000 active duty Army and Navy nurses before Pearl Harbor. So obviously a huge a huge increase, um, right? And again, people still got sick in the United States, right? So people still got sick on the home front. Uh, so finding that balance of, of adding all these additional nurses was important. Now, I like to contrast this image uh, of the nurse, uh, you know, being uh, anointed there by Uncle Sam uh, with this reality of what it meant to be a nurse uh, in World War II, right? These are a group of U.S. Army nurses uh, that landed at Normandy on D-Day plus four, right? So we've, we've talked about the war in Europe. We've talked about D-Day. Um, you know, a lot of men were being injured, of course. They would be taken out to the boats, right, to the ships that were waiting where Navy nurses would be waiting for them. Uh, but then Army nurses are finally landing on the beaches at Normandy, D-Day plus four. And you can see the beaches have been improved a little bit, um, but it's still very much a war zone. Throughout the war, nurses get closer and closer to um, the front lines, right, um, and, and are always right in the thick of it because that's where the injured, injured soldiers are, right. Um, there's a group of American women that are captured as POWs. We're going to talk the second half of our semester. We're going to cover the war in the Pacific. Um, and when the Philippines falls uh, in 1942, uh, both Manila and Corregidor, uh, you have a group of American women, Navy and Army nurses that are there um, who get captured. There's um, about 79 women who are captured by the Japanese. They're held as POWs for 37 months. Um, so this is just a couple of them that, that uh, survived eating chocolate. But you can see how thin they are, right, especially the woman on the left, right, how thin they are, um, starvation rations, all of that. Uh, so when we're talking about you know, who's in combat, who's not. 
that line gets pretty blurred, especially when it comes to the nurses because they're so close. Uh, who's captured, who's not? What happens to women as POWs? What happens to men as POWs, right? Um, so I think, I think that's important to recognize um, these nurses, of course, right? Uh, so women, women serve in a number of different uh, parts of the military, right? Uh, this, this one, I mean, could you get more girl next door, right? She's just so perfect, right? But she's a good soldier, right? When you think of soldier, do you think of this? Right, is that the image that pops into your head? Not typically. Not, not typically, My right. My grandma was a wax. Your grandma yes. was a wax. So that's yes. good, that's good, that's good, that's good. Well, this idea of, of women serving in the military, women being soldiers, is something that you have to get the public used to, right? You have to get the public used to. And so you have a lot of these images. Um, there was a huge, um, huge campaign against these women. Uh, I don't know if it was a campaign as much as uh, this idea that being in the military was a man's job, right? So if a woman wanted to serve in the military, they must just want to be around men, right, in a sexual way, or be prostitutes or camp followers kind of thing, um, or they must be lesbians and want to be a man, right? That's, that's the two choices. So there's a lot of pushback against the idea of women serving in the military, that you would be with unsavory type of people if you served in the military, uh, one of the biggest efforts that, especially the WAC, the Women's Army Corps, uh, one of their biggest pushes is to convince parents that this was a good idea for their daughters to serve in the military because parents were the ones that were pushing back a lot. Um, there's a really good book. Lisa Meyer has a really good book on, um, on uh, women in the Army and the campaign against them. Right. So you have all these different branches of the military uh, that have women in them. Um, there's a fierce competition. Right? They all have a quota of how many women they're supposed to uh, become part of their forces. Uh, and, and so this, this campaign to get women to join the Navy instead of the Army and different things like that. And they all promote different types of jobs, right? So this is a parachute rigger, right? What message are they trying to tell women? Uh, how are they trying to get women to join the Navy with this type of message? Kind of challenging them. Mm-hmm. Going to try to challenge them? It's kind of like anybody can join the wax, but can you join the waves? Right, right. This idea of, you know, you got what it takes? You think you're good enough, right? That push to challenge them, right? You know, look how important this job is, right? A parachute rigger, that's, you know, nobody uses the parachute in World War II for fun, right? <laughs> that's not, a, that's not a, a pleasure thing, right, a, or entertainment. So this idea of this is incredibly important, can you handle it, right? This, this challenge to women. Right. Then this idea of patriotism, right? To make men free. This idea of you'll be part of the gratitude, right? You'll be part. People will be thanking you. You'll be part of it. Be able to say that you you did it, right? Right. And you, the waves. So <clears throat> this is a kind of a silly thing. The Women's Army Corps was first, right? First it was the Women's Army Auxiliary Corps, the WAAC, and then it got shortened to WAC when they officially became part of the uh, army. But people made fun of their name, mainly their acronym. Whack, quack, right? This idea of, of what a silly name. So as the other branches created their own women's organizations, they worked really hard to make better names. <laughs> I know, right? But it's about the names. It's about, you know, when you're competing, you're going to work on all levels, right? So the waves... That's nice, right? That's, that's nice, right? It's an acronym. It's, you know, it's the Navy. It's water. But that's, you know, are you a wave? Are you a whack? Right? So, that, you know, it's, it's one of those silly things. Um, their uniforms were important, too. Uh, one of the women I've studied said she almost joined the Navy because they had such cute hats. Right? You know, it matters. You know, the Army, look how brown that is. Right? That's not pretty. Right? That's kind of pretty. Right? Right, here's the spars. This is the Coast Guard, right? So Semper Paratus uh, is their Latin motto, and always ready is the English version of it. So S P A R, right? Isn't that clever? Spar even sounds better than whack, right? Right. All right. And the Marines, they were just Marines. You got to respect that, right? The women Marines were just Marines, right? 
but it was free a Marine to fight. And that's the whole thing about women serving in the military. It's the idea of free a man to go do something more important, right? You can't go to combat, but the men can. So let's, let's do it, right? Um, a lot of promotion of what types of jobs you're going to be doing. There's a whole series of advertisements um, that the WAC especially has. But, you know, it has 239 kinds of jobs for women, right? You're not just going to be a typist. You could work in a laboratory. You could do all sorts of different things, right? Get, get work experience, right? The Navy promotes that you can be promoted, right? That you can, you can get these different positions, right? And talks about the fact that you're going to get the same grade and the same pay as men. So we're about equality here in the Navy. Right? You have this opportunity. Right? Again, very patriotic. Uh, there's a man-sized job for you in the Navy. Right? Right. Right. He's going to go fight. You work here. Right? This is one of my very favorites, of course. Uh, we have the Pioneer Woman statue on our campus here. So I love this image of, you know, the pioneer woman, she was out there defending her wagon with her rifle, right? Are you as good as she is, right? Can you live up to this, to this legacy, right? Uh, and again, in the WAC, you can work in a hospital, right? Not as a nurse, but separate, right? This one, I think, is interesting. So this is in the Ladies at Home Journal ad for ivory soap. Um, but how to win an engagement. Well, this is a play on words, right? She's in the military, she's a whack, right? But it's about the man, right? This is what you're fighting for, right? The, the, and you can still get your man even if you're in a uniform. Right? She does look sassy, doesn't she? A little Doris Day-ish, maybe, right? And then this is competition as well, right? You've got all these efforts to get women into the military, but we need women as ordinance workers. Right? So they have their spot, but you have yours too. They're all equally important. Right? So this competition to get women, to have women doing these different jobs. Right? Uh, there's a push for African American women as well. This was in, remember, we've got a lot of uh, prominent newspapers in African American communities, Chicago and, and other places, and they would hire artists to draw cartoons to try to promote women. Uh, of color to, to be a part of the military as well, to serve as nurses. And they did, right? This is the Postal Directory Battalion uh, that was, was in Paris. Um, and, and they did stay segregated, right? Uh, and a group of African American naval nurses, uh, they were often uh, worked with African American soldiers and sailors, right? They kept them all segregated, right? They kept blood separated, all of that, right? And then you know my favorite group here, right? Uh, the Women Air Force Service Pilots of World War II. The archives are here at TW, right in the back corner there. Um, but uh, these women uh, worked uh, to free men up so that they could go fly in combat. We have 25,000 women apply for the training program. Uh, the, the training starts in Houston, but you guys have been to Houston, right? The idea that the, the weather's not great for flying, a lot of fog and a lot of rain uh, seasonally. So then they moved out to Sweetwater, which is west of Fort Worth, of course, uh, and they did their training there. 25,000 women applied. Uh, when I started my research, I thought that number was made up because Jacqueline Cochran, the head of it, kind of makes stuff up sometimes. <laughs> She does, she does, um, but I've seen them. They're in the National Archives, all these letters that you can find of women saying, please, I want to fly. Um, only 1,830 were picked. 80% um, of the women had at least two years of college, right? They could be very selective. This is at a time when only 4% of the American women had college degrees. Uh, so it was a, a very selective group. Um, they did a wide variety of jobs. They started as ferry pilots. Uh, with the Air Transport Command, flying the planes uh, from place to place within the continental United States. They did not go overseas. They did not fly in combat. Uh, they just stayed within the continental United States. A little peek into Canada a couple times and a little peek into uh, um, the Caribbean a, a few times, but for the most part just within the continent. Um, then they moved to different jobs. Um, can you see the target back there? Right. If you're going to send men overseas, you've got to sh teach them how to shoot, right? Shooting from the deck of a B-17 against an airplane is a little different than duck hunting. 
Uh, so you got to give the men practice. They would each get two flights before they were sent overseas uh, as gunners, but you'd have women often flew these planes. Uh, this is a shot of two um, women flying this B-17 uh, while it shoots at the target uh, of the other plane. This is live ammunition, of course. It's no good to use fake. Uh, live ammunition, color-coded bullets. Um, they did this with, with a wide variety of different planes. Um, these women served as civilians. Uh, until the uh, 1970s when they started a grassroots campaign to be recognized as veterans. Uh, it's an incredible, incredible campaign. Um, and uh, they finally were given veterans benefits. This is at the con um, in Congress after they testified. This is 1977 uh, when President Carter finally recognized them as veterans um, in the United States. All of their papers are here. If you guys want to serve as interns in the women's collection, we have that. Um, and, and you could work with their papers uh, directly. But, but again, we could have an entire semester on women in war, and this is just a, a quick and dirty version of it. But if you'll just, when we walk away from class here, as we conclude, think about women in these three ways of working here in the United States domestically and abroad, and that'll help you kind of organize your thoughts. Do you guys have any questions or any final ideas or thoughts about this? Okay. Well, thank you guys very much. And uh, we'll continue our conversation uh, in our regular class on Thursday. Good job, guys. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. You too. Good job, guys. Thanks. You can watch Lectures in History every weekend on American History TV. We take you inside college classrooms to learn about topics ranging from the American Revolution to 9-11. That's Saturday at 8 p.m. and midnight Eastern on C-SPAN 3.